Tonight, KIMT is eagerly awaiting the CBS 48 Hours episode on the disappearance of our very own Jody Husentrout. But before looking ahead to tomorrow, let's take a look back at everything that's happened leading up to Jim Axelrod's investigation. The case of Jody Husentrout will be getting the 48 Hours treatment. Starting with the haunting day Jody disappeared. On June 27, 1995, Jody failed to arrive at KIMT News, where she anchored our daybreak program. Six years later, the popular anchor was declared legally dead after investigators were unable to find her. Then, in 2011, the book Dead Air was released, bringing renewed interest to the Who's in Truth mystery. There appeared to be little movement in the case until last year. That is when a search warrant was executed against John Van Sice, a person of interest in the case. But the contents of that search warrant remain sealed. And that brings us to tomorrow when CBS's Jim Axelrod will once again dig into her disappearance. We start tonight with major new developments in the investigation of an officer involved shooting on the railway. It is a story you will not see anywhere else. KIMT was there the night of November 29th, just after Union Pacific Special Agent Lewis Minor fired and hit Nathan Olson at the intersection of 9th Street Northwest in North Monroe Avenue in Mason City. We know there was an altercation between Minor and Olson that turned physical. But until now, there have been a number of unanswered questions regarding Minor's conduct that night. But KIMT is digging into the investigation tonight to get those answers for you. Yes, indeed, Katie. There are three major unknowns in this investigation that we've been working to shed light on. The first, what video evidence does the Iowa Department of Criminal Investigation have to work with? Second, what policy does Union Pacific Railroad have when it comes to agents using firearms? And third, did Special Agent Minor have other options to subdue Olson? To get you some answers, we went right to the source. Our source for information on the railroad shooting, Union Pacific's head of communications, Raquel Espinoza. Question number one, do officers wear body cameras or have car cameras? Espinoza's statement, while Special Agent Minor was not wearing a body camera, his vehicle was equipped with a forward-facing camera. And how many agents are armed and what is policy on force in general? Says Espinoza, all special agents are sworn police officers and carry firearms. Our policy states agents will use reasonable force to protect the life of the agent or another person and effectively bring an incident under control. Raising the question, do officers have any non-lethal options? Espinoza, agents carry pepper gel or spray, tasers and batons. And as far as why Special Agent Minor used his gun instead of those options, well, we still don't have answers. We do know, though, he's on paid administrative leave while the Iowa DCI completes its investigation. And the man who was shot, Nathan Olson, remains hospitalized at Mercy Medical Center, North Iowa. As of tonight, he's listed in fair condition. The Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension is sharing what led to the officer-involved shooting in Albert Lee yesterday that left one man dead. 27-year-old Joseph Roberts died from gunshot wounds. The three peace officers involved were Lieutenant Darren Palmer, Officer Jesus Canto, and Officer Jason Taylor. We've got plenty of people out on the roads taking a look at those conditions for you. That includes meteorologist Brandon Libby. He is live outside. Brandon, what can you tell us about the conditions? Thank you so much, Sarah. Right now, I'm just off of I-90. I'm on a rest area on ramp, and I'm about a mile east of I-35. You can actually see I-90 right behind me. You'll eventually see some cars passing. They are going very slow, as they should. As of 9 o'clock, I made my way from Mason City to Albert Lee. I saw two spinouts in that time period. Roads were very, very slick, and again, that was about an hour ago, so the road's likely worse than that. And uh, you should be taking it slow if you're going to be doing any traveling. Here's what the roads look like right now through southern Minnesota, uh, completely covered for everywhere except for around the Albert Lee area, just partially covered roadways according to the DOT. And then in North Iowa, we are seeing partially covered roadways in and around the Mason City area. The rest of North Iowa seeing wet roadways, but I'd be willing to bet that in town and on the less traveled roadways seeing some very, very slick conditions. We do have KIMT News 3's Brooke McKivergan. She is live in uh, Storm Tracker 3 in Rochester. Brooke, how are the roads looking for you? I'm currently driving on Highway 52 South 
where, as you can see, the conditions aren't great. The roads are slick. We're currently, again, on 52 South, where the speed limit is 60, and we're going about 45, 50 miles per hour, and we're not the only ones. I did just speak with the Minnesota Department of Transportation about an hour ago, and they're definitely prepared for this event. They tell me there are 102 plows in southeast Minnesota, with 200 drivers who take turns on 12-hour shifts. Something to look out for this evening, they have a new tow plow that covers two lanes. So if you see this new plow, be sure to leave them plenty of room. These plows will stay out on the roads all night until the roads are clear, and I'm going to stay out here on the roads to watch these conditions for you. So for now, reporting live in Rochester, Brooke McKibbergan, KIMT News 3. Election results are rolling in, and KIMT is on the ground at the polling places, getting the numbers for you first. Thank you for joining us. I'm Katie Lang. Continuing our coverage now of a deadly shooting in Rochester. Let's go to KIMT News 3's Brooke McKivergan on scene tonight. Brooke, what do we know now? Katie, I'm still here in the 2800 block of Charles Court Northwest, and just about three minutes ago, I did see about five police officers walking towards the scene with a canine. And of course, when I arrived on the scene, I saw a canine leading officers into the scene that they now have blocked off. I spoke with Captain Sherwin who tells me officers responded to a 911 shots fired call, arrived on the scene and did find a body. They made life-saving attempts but unfortunately were not successful. Police are still looking for a suspect. Stay with KIMT for the latest details. I will still be on the scene so be sure to check back in with us. For now, live in Rochester, Brooke McKibbergan, KIMT News 3. Okay, we are receiving word that the president has arrived at the Rochester International Airport. We want to go right now to Brooke McKivigan, who is standing by. Brooke. Well, Amy, Air Force One has just landed here at the Rochester International Airport. Annalise Johnson and I are going to take a step out of the frame, give you a live look here. The president is being greeted by several senators and a few people from District 1B. That's right, Annalise, and now they'll make their way downtown to the Mayo Civic Center where the rally is being held. We also have reporters on scene there to continue to give you a live look. And as we await uh, the president uh, to come out of the plane, we want to remind everyone the rally at the Civic Center is at 6.30 tonight, and you can watch that in its entirety on KIMT.com. have team coverage for you this morning as President Trump heads to Rochester later on tonight. So he's expected to land at Rochester's International Airport at around 5.30. Then his campaign-style rally is scheduled to start at around 6.30, all happening at the Mayo Civic Center. Now we have a team of reporters covering everything for you today. We'll first go live to KIMT News 3's Dee Dee Steepen. She is outside the Civic Center where people are already lining up. Good morning, Dee Dee. Tyler, good morning. The president will be hosting his rally here at the Civic Center in just a matter of hours. Now, right now, no one is allowed inside. There's going to be security sweeps uh, going on all morning and into the afternoon. Uh, but the doors will open to the public at 4 o'clock. And uh, as you can see, uh, there are already a line of people out here anxious to get inside. Uh, I've been talking to a lot of these folks, and many of them are coming from out of town, some even out of state. So there is a lot of people that came here to Rochester for this event today. We'll hear from some of them a little bit later in the newscast. Uh, but for now, with so many visitors here in Rochester, let's check with KIMT News 3's Annalisa Pardo, who's finding out how hotels are managing all of these people. Annalisa, good morning. Well, DD Rochester Hotels tell me they're actually used to a busy city because of all the traffic they get from Mayo Clinic. But this presidential visit is still having them adjust a little bit. Now, I called a couple of uh, Rochester hotels downtown, and they tell me they're booked, but not seeing any major change because of the visit. Christine Erke with the Center Stone Hotel downtown says it's an honor to have a president visit, but it does present some challenges. The biggest challenge isn't accommodating more people, but still accommodating its guests, like getting them shuttled where they need to go. Even though this event's going on, we still have guests here for medical reasons. They need to get back to the hotel in a timely manner. I have to, we have to take care of our guests. I also checked Airbnb prices this morning. You can still get an Airbnb tonight for as low as $29. Now, some of the hotel managers I talked to say this could be because the rally is midweek and many people just may be coming for the day, but not necessarily spending the night here in Rochester. Live in Rochester, Annalisa Pardo, KIMT News 3. 
29 bucks on Elisa. That's a steal. We're investigating a fatal shooting. And this is where it happened at the 2800 block of Charles Court Northwest. And that's where KIMT News 3's Annalisa Pardo is. And Annalisa, new this morning, we now know the name of the victim as well as the suspects. That's right, Tyler and Ariel. We have new information of this ongoing investigation this morning. Now, Rochester police say they still don't know what the circumstances were that led to the shooting, but they do believe there was no connection between the suspects and the victim uh, prior to the incident. They're exploring uh, robbery as a possible motive. Now, here's what happened. Rochester police responded to a shots fired and man down call around 9 p.m. Monday night. Now, when they arrived, they found 40-year-old Ahmed Nadoff wounded on the ground without a pulse. Now, there were life-saving efforts initiated between Rochester police, Rochester fire, and Gold Cross ambulance, but were unsuccessful. Uh, Nadoff was pronounced dead around 9.15 p.m. Now, three people are in custody at Olmsted County Jail facing charges of second degree murder. Uh, their names are on your screen right now. All are in their early to mid 20s and from Rochester. Now, Rochester police say they're working on drafting search warrants and getting additional uh, information from witnesses. And we'll share that information with us later today. And then we will share that information as soon as it's available to us. For now, live in Rochester, Annalisa Pardo, KIMT News 3. And now, I just got that press release. And let me tell you what it says. So, according to the Dodge County Sheriff's Office, the boy's body has been found. It was found in a deeper part of the pond. They say that they will be. Um, doing an autopsy tomorrow to confirm that it was an accidental drowning. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Katie Hinker. First, breaking news. A month-long search has come to a devastating discovery. The body of missing University of Iowa student Molly Tibbetts is likely recovered. And within the last hour, we learned one suspect is behind bars charged with her murder. His name is Christian Rivera. In a press conference today, authorities are detailing what Rivera says happened. KIMT News 3's Raquel Hellman joins us live now from our Studio 3 to tell us more. Raquel. Yeah, Katie, the terrible news is echoing throughout our area. Now, this is a look at the scene in rural Poesheet County, where authorities say they found the body believed to be Molly Tibbetts. The 20 year old was last seen jogging on July 18th near her home in Brooklyn, Iowa. Now, Christian Rivera is charged with first degree murder in connection to her disappearance. Investigators say surveillance video shows Tibbetts jogging in a rural area near Brooklyn, as well as Rivera's car. During a press conference just a couple of hours ago, authorities detailed an interview with Rivera where he laid out what he says happened. Rivera says he saw Molly running and approached her. When she reportedly said she was going to call 911 and took off running, that's when Rivera claims he blacked out and later came to near an intersection where officials believe he placed her body. While the body found this morning is believed to be Molly Tibbetts, officials are still waiting for the test results to confirm it. That autopsy is going to take place tomorrow up in Ankeny at the state medical examiner's office. And so we will rate, await those results. Uh, sometimes that takes a while, and uh, that'll aid us as well in the investigation. How long do you think? Very sad news, and Rivera is being held on a federal immigration detainer as the Department of Homeland Security says he is an illegal alien believed to have been in the Brooklyn area for four to seven years. Live in Studio 3, Raquel Hellman, KIMT News 3. All right, thank you very much, Raquel, for that report. And we will let you know the results of that autopsy as soon as it's made available to us. Stay with KIMT on air and online for the very latest. It is a story that originated in rural Blooming Prairie that's now capturing nationwide attention. The search for Lois Reese. Second degree murder charges are pending for Lois in the murder of her husband, David Reese. His body was found on March 23rd at their wax worm farm. Lois has been on the run ever since, and now she's accused of second, a second murder, this time in southwest Florida, sparking the national search. And to take a look at where Reese has been spotted, let's go to KIMT News 3's Brooke McKivergan. She's live in the Rochester studio. Brooke, what can you tell us? 
Katie Raquel, according to David Reese's uncle, there have been more than 38 leads on Lois's whereabouts. It all started in rural, rural Blooming Prairie, then she traveled over 1,500 miles down to Fort Myers. Since then, investigators say she's suspected of being near Corpus Christi, Texas, another 1,300 miles. It's in southwest Florida that she's accused of murder of 59-year-old Pamela Hutchinson. Authorities say Hutchinson was found with fatal gunshot wounds and that her purse was in disarray earlier this week. Hutchinson's cash, credit card, Cards, ID, and vehicle were stolen. Further investigation revealed that Ms. Hutchinson was targeted by the suspect due to the similarities in their appearance. Now this is the car she is suspected of stealing and potentially currently driving, a white 2005 Acura TL. The Lee County Sheriff's Office is also releasing new surveillance photos of Lois Reese of Lois Reese in Fort Myers. The Sheriff's Department says their crimes unit is working around the clock, reviewing hundreds of hours of videos and traveled throughout the state and collected hundreds of items for forensic investigation. Live in the newsroom, Brooke McKivergan, KIMT News 3. Brooke, thank you very much. And Reese is considered armed and dangerous. Authorities say she should not be approached. If you know anything about her whereabouts, call 911. KIMT continues to follow a shocking story tonight out of Worth County. Law enforcement and out of state agencies were called to 1,000 block of Highway 9 in Manly this morning to rescue just under 200 dogs. KIMT News 3's Brian Tabak was there when it all happened. Truck after truck, you could hear the faint sound of barking through the bitter cold winds. The Worth County Sheriff's Office is teaming up with the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, or ASPCA, to rescue over 170 Samoyeds, ranging in age from elderly to just a few weeks old. This is a overwhelming situation. Tim Rickey is one of around 30 members of the ASPCA called in to help with the operation and to set up safe places for the dogs to go. There's a lack of sanitation and uh, just generally not adequate care for these animals. According to online records, the house is listed as White Fire Kennel, owned by Barb Cavaris. Sheriff Fank with the Worth County Sheriff's Office says they've known about the conditions for several months and have even tried to help. It's been going on almost a year that we've been back and forth dealing because at first you would give up a few animals to the Humane Society and we thought it kept working, we could get her dwindled down, but we just lost ground. Fank says White Fire Kennel was once USDA licensed, but that has since been revoked. Now the ASPCA is asking for people to educate themselves before buying a pet. Anybody looking for an animal, be responsible in where you're purchasing those animals so you're not supporting uh, substandard puppy mills. Crews were on scene for around 10 hours. In Manly, Brian Tabak, KIMT News 3. Meanwhile, students are back in class after a semi crashed into a school building in Lyle on Tuesday. Here's what we know tonight. Minnesota state troopers say a car was turning left on Highway 218 and a semi behind the car was unable to slow down in time and rear ended the car. The semi went into the ditch and crashed into a high school art room. Two passengers in the car and two students in the building were injured. The semi driver, Jeffrey Coles, has a history of speeding. He's received 16 traffic violations and Minnesota between 2001 and 2013, eight of which were speeding tickets. Now, as of today, no charges have been filed for Tuesday's crash, but today there's one student who was not in school. KIMT News 3's Emily Boster is sitting down with the girl who was face to face with the tire of that semi that crashed through her school. Here's what she has to say. Alexis Branstad isn't at school today due to her injuries. That's because she was in this classroom behind me when that semi came plowing through the wall. When an 18-wheeler came crashing through Branstad's art room in school, everything became a blur. It was very scary. I was doing an art project and the next thing I know I heard something and grabbed my head and I got knocked unconscious, so I didn't really know what happened. 16-year-old Branstad says she woke up to a fellow student calling her name. It put me in shock because I didn't know what was going on. It was, I mean, the semi was right there. The tire was right next to me. Now she has a fractured nose, stitches, along with several cuts and bruises. Just yesterday, she visited the school, her classroom, to get an idea of what really happened to her. Scary knowing what happened a couple days before that. and how easily things can happen like that. But I think it was kind of heartbreaking to see it because it, it's a very scary situation. 